is today horror master John Carpenter's 70th birthday, or would this have been John Carpenter's 70th birthday? I don't know. According to John Carpenter, he's still alive, but Rotten Tomatoes is saying that uh, he has passed on to the great beyond. Who knows who you're going to believe? The only thing I can tell you for certain is the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. I am Jeff McAleer. I am back once again as your host of The Daily Dope. And I am also the Grand Poobah of the GamingGang.com. And yes, it is true. Earlier today, Rotten Tomatoes tweeted out, Hey, a happy what would have been 70th birthday to John Carpenter. And uh, John Carpenter is not dead, at least as far as I know and as at least as far as John Carpenter is indicating, he has not passed on. Hmm, kind of strange. Anyway, uh, I have to be very, very honest. I am way under the weather today. And as the day started off, I, f I felt okay. Well, I woke up this morning, wasn't feeling too great. And as the day has progressed, I am feeling worse and worse. I am hoping it is not this damn flu that's floating around, but I don't know. Anywho, so I am going to try to struggle through today's show. Uh, probably going to be a bit shorter. I do have a review of Sword and Sorcery, but I'll be the first to admit this is going to be kind of a, a quick review. There's, there's a ton to the game. And I know there's there's plenty of other videos that are out there that are going to give you like a breakdown of you know, how to play and so on and so forth. And I just I I don't feel that great, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. Just going to kind of give you a quick overview of the game. But I'm going to focus more on what I like and what I may not care for as far as sword and sorcery, and try to compare it to some other dungeon crawlers that I have played to give you a better idea if it should be part of your collection or not. Anyway, uh, kind of a slow news day today too, but I do have some pieces and there's one item that I'm super excited about. It's not gaming related, it is comic book related and I will get to that in just a bit. But uh, if you were expecting a show yesterday on Friday, I completely zoned out that uh, Monday was Martin Luther King Day. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I should say. So major holidays, I'm not doing shows. Uh, there's a reason why I don't want to necessarily get into it, but if kids have the day off from school and it's a big holiday, I probably will not be doing a show. Not that I have kids, but like I said, there's kind of a reason why. Anyway, uh, chat is up. Let me uh, go uh, pop over to, there we go. So I've got uh, the chat up, the chat on Twitch, YouTube, it is not on the screen, but uh, if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, pop up a, a quick item in the chat and I will address that. Also, if uh, you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about The Daily Dope or TheGamingGang.com, be sure to uh, email me at mailbag at TheGamingGang.com. So this weekend, I had a, an opportunity to do a lot of gaming. It was very, very cool. Thankfully, I felt fine all weekend long so i got in uh plenty of plenty of action and something i'll talk about tomorrow because it's war game wednesday is how i introduced my nephew and his friends to the venerable fletcher pratt's naval war game which uh hint hint they loved i was a little surprised i had my fingers crossed that they would like it but uh, also on tomorrow's show knock on wood but I'm feeling okay, and it's not this damn flu. I'm going to show you how to play Night of Man from my pals over at Flying Pig Games. And it is a Mark H. Walker design. It's good stuff. I have a review of it over at the Gaming Gang to check out. 
Uh, I'm just wearing a backward hat for the heck of it today. Just change things up a little bit. Just, uh, you know, whatever. I don't know. It's uh, Maybe it's just an indication of feeling blah. It's like, blah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so there is some news today. So let's move into that. And uh, if you happen to be a fan of um, Century uh, Spice Road, then you're probably going to be interested in checking out something that had only been available from Plan B Games through their website, but it is coming to retail. And yes, it is Century Golem Edition. I always thought it's pronounced Golem, but if I say that, then everybody starts thinking Lord of the Rings. So I think I'll stick to just Golem. Anyway, I have the dope from Plan B. That's right, Plan B Games is very proud to announce that Century Golem Edition will be available in retailers later this year. Debuting at Gen Con 50 last year, Century Golem Edition was met with such fanfare and critical acclaim that yes, it is now going to be available through retailers. Fans adored the manga-inspired artwork, gorgeous components, and of course, the elegant game mechanisms. Although the Golem Edition was originally sold exclusively on the Plan B web store, its popularity was undeniable. Plan B Games has paired with international partners to bring Century Golem Edition to retailers in North America, the UK, France, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, and Japan, beginning right about the second quarter of this year. Century Golem Edition was designed by Emerson Matsushi. Matsushi? Hopefully I'm close, and is a fantasy-themed version of the smash hit Century Spice Road. In the game, players serve as crystal traders who establish a trading network to collect the right combination of crystals to activate powerful ancient golems. In an effort to distinguish the golem edition from Spice Road, all the components were replaced to match the exciting new setting. Fans looking to optimize their gaming experience should consider purchasing the Century Golem Edition playmat, which will still be found exclusively at the Plan B web store. Century Golem Edition is best suited for crystal traders ages 10 and older. While it could take a century to establish a crystal trading network, we expect a game of Century Golem Edition to only take 30 to 45 minutes. Century Golem Edition features all new artwork and components that are completely different from those in the Spice Road version, including 105 plastic crystals and 4 plastic crystal bowls, 104 cards, and 20 copper and silver tokens. The MSRP, when it arrives, will be $39.99. I have to be very, very honest. I have not played... Actually, I haven't played any Plan B game titles. To my knowledge... Hmm. I did reach out to them. Never heard anything back. That's okay. I'll still release their news when it sounds like it's something pretty cool. Talking about pretty cool, my friends over at Modifius Entertainment seem to always be releasing something. They have always got something cooking and now the infinity role-playing game which is based on the uh corbus belai belai yeah it's belai uh skirmish miniatures game and they've got some releases for infinity beginning today in pdf that's right and i've got the dope from modifius Today, we're really pleased to announce a raft of PDF releases for our eagerly awaited Infinity role-playing game, including the core rulebook, player's guide, and the adventures in the human sphere and Quantronic Heat adventures, and they are available now as part of the Infinity collection on Drive-Thru RPG. I will mention, just kind of jumping off the press release, I believe it was last week... Sometimes these shows kind of all merge into one. But I want to say the news last week was that um, Modifius had a bunch of quick start rules uh, that they had released on Drive-Thru RPG that were free. And Infinity is one of them. 
just so you know. Anyway, back to the news. For the last 10 years, players have tested their mettle upon the battlefields of the human sphere in Corvus Belli's hugely popular Infinity Skirmish game. Now you can expand your adventures with the 500 page plus, well, 500 plus page, I guess I would say, full color Infinity RPG core book, diving deep into the amazing, never before seen depths of the Infinity universe with the ultimate science fiction role playing game. Hey, that is uh, quite a. Um, Quite a claim to make there, guys. The ultimate science fiction role-playing game? I don't know. In the Infinity Player's Guide, you'll shape powerful science fiction characters to explore this universe with an immersive lifespan, or I should say life path, character creation system that allows you to choose from a wide range of backgrounds from crazed dog warrior I might have the crazed part right. Don't know about the dog warrior. I mean, for me personally. To the empath empathic Toha? Okay, the Toha. Define options such as attributes or attributes, faction, heritage, homeworld, social status, education, and career. Select your starting gear from a wide range of equipment, such as the hacking device and programs you'll utilize or the type of weapon and ammo you prefer. You can discover much more of humanity's near future, covering the systems and factions of the human sphere and beyond. Bonus content exclusive to the player's guide include the Agent Handler Guide, 2D22N3 Conversion Guide, and stats for the iconic miniatures produced for the RPG. Cool. Adventures in the Human Sphere provides a collection of far-reaching missions, each designed to thrust your agents into the path of machinations and conflicts that jeopardize the fragile alliances which bind humanity together. In Infinity Quantronic Heat, that's kind of a... I don't want to say strange, it's kind of a cool name? I don't... Quantronic Heat, starring Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. Anyway, in Infinity Quantronic Heat, you'll find the... I'm sorry, you'll fin. I don't know what fin might mean. That must be sort of a... Uh, I thought it was fine, and they dropped the D. But I guess finning would be maneuvering around? I don't know. You'll fin amid the glittering skyscraper-studded city block arcologies of Neoterra, the backbiting industrial espionage... Espionage... Duh. Holy, I'm not feeling too hot. Just, I had, God, my presentation is just worse than usual today. Oh. The industrial espionage of the hypercore has finally boiled over into open violence and murder. Or has it? When Bureau Noir agents are called in to investigate the shocking corporate raid, they quickly discover there's a deeper conspiracy in play. A terrorist splinter group pursues a mysterious scheme of quantronic brickmanship, which threatens the entire human sphere in this three-part campaign, which ranges from the rain-slick streets of Neoterra to a stunning action-packed finale as you pursue terrorists back to the frozen <laughs> Svalarheimen base and a planet-wide investigation of epic scale. We hope you'll enjoy this first raft of Infinity releases, which also includes a package of free character sheets, and look out for more far-flung sci-fi adventures from Corvus Belli's Infinity coming soon. As I previously had mentioned, these are only available in PDF, and off the top of my head, I want to say that the... Core book is $19.99. I think the player's guide was $12.99. And one of the adventure books is $10.99 and the other is $7.99. Do not quote me on that, except for the core book. I'm 95% positive it is $19.99. And I have to admit, I am not familiar with the Corvus Belli Infinity Skirmish rules but I have heard through the grapevine that uh, it's a pretty good system. I mean, there are so many miniature systems out there that uh, it's 
kind of like role playing games. It's pretty tough to try to <laughs> stay on top of all of them. Anyway, next up, I've got some news from my pals over at Greenbrier Games, because if you have enjoyed of Dreams and Shadows, then you will be certainly keeping an eye open for the expansion that is going to arrive very shortly from Greenbrier Games, and it is of Dreams and Shadows, The Monster Within. Yes, it is an expansion, and if you're not familiar with Of Dreams and Shadows, it's a cooperative board game for up to six players who take on the role of champions trying to save their realm. As they direct the actions of their champions on the game board, players participate in a collaborative story. The consequences of their choices advance the storyline. Opposing the players is one of the three selectable villains with their own host of deadly servants. Developing flexible tactics and teamwork among players will be crucial as there are over 30 different enemies, each with their own special ability. As far as the expansion, The Monster Within, now you can carry on the story. Players who completed certain scenarios in the core game will begin the expansion with scenario cards that reflect the choices they made. So there is a legacy aspect to this game. Uh, I should say the expansion. There's obviously a legacy mechanic uh, portion of, uh, of um, Dreams and Shadows. Anyway, there are added gameplay rules for initiating scenarios, linking a completed world scenario with a quest scenario, and playing alternate characters in any scenario. In addition, the resource deck is now customizable and will scale with the number of players in the game. Of Dreams and Shadows, Monsters Within is like the core game, for two to six players ages 14 and up and it will play in about two and a half hours. The expansion is going to carry an MSRP of $29.95. I do not know how Of Dreams and Shadows flew under my radar from Greenbrier. I gotta be honest, I thought it was already, uh, I thought it wasn't out yet. And I did reach out to my friend Julie Ahern from Greenbrier and ask, um, how did I miss this? Because usually Greenbrier stuff, I'm right on top of. I've, I've got quite a few different Greenbrier game reviews up at uh, thegamegang.com, and Julie had mentioned that that had actually released at Essen in 2016. I'm like, hmm, okay. So I actually may be getting an opportunity to take a look at the core game. So that will be pretty cool because I dig uh, and it doesn't strike me as like it's a dungeon delve kind of game, but it does strike me as there's a lot of story going on and I dig board games that are like that. Anyway, so that is it for the gaming news of the day, but I have one last news piece and I have mentioned on the gaming gang.com. I also talked about it on this show uh, maybe about a month ago. My favorite comic of all time is Strangers in Paradise. And I have to say, I am thrilled to see my favorite comic making a return. Because yes, beginning this week, from Abstract Studios, is an all-new 10-issue story arc featuring my beloved SIP cast. My fingers are crossed that we're going to see far more than 10 issues. And I am certainly going to be popping into my friendly local comic store tomorrow. I don't care if I'm on death's door because I am going to snag the first issue of Strangers in Paradox. Uh, Paradox, duh. Oh, I'm telling you, I am just zoning here. And I have not taken any medication either, so it's I can't blame like cough syrup or something. Anyway, I am certainly going to go pop in and pick up the first issue of Strangers in Paradise 25. Or it's also being indicated with the Roman numerals XXV. Anyway, I'm serious. I can't wait to see what Terry Moore has up his sleeve for Francine and Catchu. 
in celebration of the original series 25th anniversary of um, their first issue. Anyway, I've got the dope from Abstract Studios. America's favorite couple is back. To celebrate its 25th anniversary, the Eisner Award-winning series is back with an all-new story beginning with this number one issue. Francine and Ketchu are living the dream until they learn a former Parker girl is in hiding and writing a tell-all book about the wicked empire Darcy Parker built with Ketchu at her side. Determined to stop her, Ketchu enlists the aid of her mercenary sister Tambi, and the hunt is on. Yes, of course, you would have to have been a fan of Strangers in Paradise or be a fan of Strangers in Paradise to me to understand what any of that means. But I get it. So I am pumped. I am, I gotta be honest. I mean, I have not looked forward to a comic book like I am now <laughs> in a long, long time. So uh, I can't stress highly enough how good Strangers in Paradise is. And uh, you can always, you know, do a search for Strangers in Paradise on the gaminggang.com and you will see, you will read why I think it is a phenomenal comic. And I really have missed it. I mean, Terry Moore has been doing great stuff since he wrapped up Strangers in Paradise. But everybody out there was still, oh, come on, Terry. Come on. Can't you bring it back a little bit? Come on, just for a while. So I uh, do know that this is a 10-issue story arc and I certainly am hoping that uh, we will see more than 10 issues. I'm hoping that um, that Terry's back and he's going to do a um, good long run on Str Strangers in Paradise. Or what did I start to call it? Strangers in... I don't know. I don't know. I can't believe I mispronounced the title of my favorite comic. Yeah, okay. Anyway, moving right along. So I, uh, I was talking about how I'm going to kind of, uh, kind of review Sword and Sorcery from Ares Games and yeah, making sure I don't have it upside down. What did I, was it Shutterbug last week? I was like, oh yeah, Shutterbug, <laughs> yeah. Dummy, 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 dummy. And uh, it is from Ares Games and Goblin Project. And you may recall that those two teamed up for Galaxy Defenders a few years ago. I, uh, I actually previewed the Kickstarter, but never actually saw the finished product. I don't know. It was cool. I thought it was a, the, as long as the game ended up um, looking the same and playing the same as the Kickstarter preview that I had received from Ares, then by all means, uh, I'm sure it's very, very good. Anyway, but I am going to uh, take a look here at... Uh, Sword and Sorcery, Immortal Souls. I should toss in that little... Sub, it's not really a subtitle, but... Toss that in, because uh, this is the first of a proposed series of games from Ares. And uh, let's uh, pop over to the other camera here. And uh, I'm going to show off a little bit. Like I said in the beginning, I'm not going to go through tons and tons of detail about how to play mainly because I know there are loads and loads of videos out there already going really in-depth into you know, each, each round of the game and so on and so forth. But then the summary, this is what I find with a lot of video reviews. And I don't watch a whole lot of video reviews. I tend to, tend to watch uh, more how to play if I'm having a hard time figuring out a game which is not unusual. Uh, I'll, I'll sometimes pop in and take a peek at, uh, you know, how to play or something like that. But uh, I find a lot of times with with video reviews that um, folks are way, way too focused on, okay, this is every small, tiny aspect of how to play the game. And then when it comes to wrapping it up, they just, oh yeah, it's good. Okay, that seriously did not tell me what I need to know about the game. I mean, if I were, you know, a, a prospective buyer. So uh, I'm going to kind of go over a little bit, very, 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 very kind of high level view of Sword and Sorcery Immortal Souls because there's a lot going on in this game. There are a lot of little aspects of the game and I'll be the first to tell everybody it can be really overwhelming. 
it can be really, really overwhelming. And I'm not going to say that the, the rule book itself is presented poorly. It's okay. It, um, it, uh, in fact, I'll give you an example. I'll kind of show you the, the rule book here. And you know, this is a pretty good sized rule book. And you'll see that there are loads of illustrations in the rules. For an example, you know, that's just kind of showing a setup. Examples for the terrain, the game sequence, the event phase, the heroes. So there is, it's not as if you're sitting there reading an old Avalon Hill rule book where it's all case point. Okay, so in rule 27.3.7.4, no, it's, you know, there's loads and loads of illustrations and just kind of talking about uh, various aspects of the game. That said, I just, it just didn't click as well as I would have liked when I'm reading a rule book. Uh, and I found that kind of unusual. And I don't know if it's specifically because this is trans translated because, of course, Ares and uh, Goblin Project are not uh, U.S. or U.K. companies. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it was. Um, but it took me quite a bit of time to, to really wrap my head around these rules. And I don't know. I, I can't put my finger on what it was. Maybe it's because they just kind of carry on and on and on about stuff. And some of this, and it could have been just trimmed down a little bit. Maybe that's what was kind of throwing me off. Uh, but that is the rule book. Then there's a scenario book. Then there is a reference chart sheet, I guess we would say, that uh, that helps you out. Surprisingly enough, there's only one. And you know, this game is for up to six players, so. I would have thought maybe we would have had uh, more than one copy of this. But there is loads and loads of stuff. And it, of course, you know, space is at a premium. You might want to try to zoom in. Let me move this down a little bit. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that from this game that I do not have out here on the table. Uh, but tons of tokens and indicators and all this other stuff um, that I just didn't necessarily feel that I had to, uh, to bust out and try to try to maneuver around anyway so the premise of the game is that the the players the heroes uh have been uh, resurrected and they don't have very clear memories of who they are and because they're, they're legendary heroes but they're not going to start off as legendary heroes in the game you're going to have to go through the scenarios and as the game continues on, they begin to unlock memories, which unlock more powers, and they become much more powerful individuals. So there's a variety of characters to choose from. So that was one thing I did, did dig about the game, is that uh, you're not shackled with just... Um, uh, there's a couple more floating around. But uh, you're not sh stuck with, okay, well, you've got to play this character. There's, there's enough variety in there. And you've got the characters are either going to be strength-based, dexterity-based, magic-based, or uh, religiously based, like, you know, clerics would be. Faith-based, I guess we would say. So there are a variety of miniatures that are included in the game, and I'm just going to show you one of the heroes. The heroes are all in gray, and the sculpts are cool. I like the sculpts. Sculpts are nice, but this is a prime example. I'm going to try to, there we go. Let's kind of get it where, uh, what's going on, Jeff? There, I want to try to get that blue in the background so you can see this sword. So they're plastic, and the thing is, the plastic isn't like super soft plastic like some miniatures in uh, some board games are, where everything bends. 
Uh, but the problem is, loads and loads of these, especially when we get to the thinner parts, are just out of shape. And yes, of course, you can go and you can take with plastic miniatures, you can boil the miniatures. You gotta be careful, though. And uh, you can actually straighten this out. Only problem is, a lot of times it's going to res revert back to this shape like this. So, uh, if you're planning on painting the miniatures, this is really where it falls in a an issue. If you're going to paint them, you're going to have to treat them once you get this straightened out, and you can't sit there and wait for it to happen. Uh, but yeah, that was a little disappointing as far as the miniatures. I should also point out that these miniatures are not true 28 slash 32 millimeter. They are quite, well, I don't want to say quite a bit smaller. They are noticeably smaller. So those out there who are like, well, you know, I could always pick up the game just for the minis. Uh, keep that in mind. These are not 32 millimeter scale. So uh, that is one of the heroes. And as I had mentioned, the heroes will have a card. And the card just kind of basically starts off like this. It's just showing the hero. Uh, and then it's going to have different slots all around that you're going to place different cards, different equipment, different items that they receive, weapons, so on and so forth. And I am going to mention that uh, you're going to need some space to play this game. You really do, because um, you'll have, and of course these cards don't really correspond to this character, but I'm going to pop these... You're going to have cards all over around your character. So you're going to need some space there. There are loads and loads of different decks. Uh, something else I thought was cool are these soul gems. And it's a wheel. Well, it's actually, it's actually a hex. It's hexagonal shape. But you'll see that as your character, whoops, as I bumped it. This is your starting abilities for this character. I get a little shadow there. Sorry about that. Let's try to angle that a little bit, get a better look. And uh, as your character basically levels up as the game moves along, you're going to see you're just going to turn the dial. And you'll notice that a lot of these numbers change. I thought that was neat. I liked that. Thought that was very handy. Uh, got a lot of dice rolling in the game. You're going to have red dice, which are attack dice. And these are 10 siders. And they are cut. These are not painted on. So I like that. I like the fact that it's they're 10-sided dice because it gives you more variance than, say, standard six-sided dice. And uh, I thought that was nice. I think the dice are nicely done. So these are the attack dice. And these are your defense dice. Blue. Blue is for defense. And the one thing I thought was a little odd is there's only four of each. And with a game with six players, I'd have thought maybe they'd throw in a few more. But uh, keep in mind, you're going to be actually sharing the dice and uh, handing them off all around the table all game long. There are multitude of different decks, encounters, events, story events. You've got an enemy deck. You've got the various different monsters, monster cards, which see that. And then it gives you the details for the monsters. One thing I was surprised is there is not a large variety of monsters in this game. Because... All right, where'd the other gremlins go? Where you hide? Where are you hide? There we go, okay. So, you're gonna see There's blue, green, and red. Now, the artwork is a little bit different as far as the background. And then how tough they are is going to change as well. But still, 
they're just goblins. And you'll see that uh, the miniatures are color coded by the enemy. So when it calls for a green goblin, <laughs> how about that, right? Spider-Man's going to show up. It's going to lay the smack down. Nah, different green goblin. So if your enemy deck says it's a, a green goblin, then you're going to refer to the card for the green goblin. And it's going to tell you that uh, what kind of attacks they've got at different ranges. One thing I thought was a little odd is that, uh, like, at further out, the goblin can throw rocks, and it just, you know, kind of automatically does damage. I mean, or automatically hits, right? But uh, closer in, it's not guaranteed to hit. I thought that was a little weird. Wouldn't it be a little harder for the goblin to hit you with a rock than it is to bite a character, or like user, I should say, user claws on a character to attack? Don't know. So then we got a couple of big bosses. And uh, once again, pretty cool detail. This is a pretty good size mini compared to the goblin here. Kind of compare it to, uh, ah, grab one of the other heroes. So good size. Like the, uh, one's a troll and the other is a uh, orc. So, miniatures, all in all, uh, I like the sculpts. Do not like the production quality of them. Sorry, gotta be honest. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, here, here we go. Here's another prime example, right? So, carrying a staff, that staff is bent. And because, as I mentioned, this isn't like the real soft plastic. I can't, if I go like that, boom goes right back into place kind of a bummer sort of a bummer uh anyway uh we've got so you've got your enemies but your enemies will also have powers which you will select if the card indicates that the enemy has a power you're going to draw from this enemy power deck which i thought was kind of cool because it means that even though there's only a handful and it's a small handful of different creatures, different baddies you're going up against, they're not all going to play the same. Oops. It is. Oh, that's right side up. I'm saying I thought it looked like it was upside down. So I thought that was kind of neat. Then we've got different powers. Uh, grab the deck that you've got different powers available for the various characters and you'll start off with a power and then as you progress you will be able to uh, get more powers the powers you have become more more powerful and I thought another aspect I thought was kind of cool was as you there we go as you kind of level up with these powers they're, you can't use them every single combat turn. So there, there's actually a cooldown, and it will tell you based on the level of the power that you've got when you use it, how long it's going to take for you to um, to recharge it, really. I know saying cooldown is more of a video gamer's term, but th that's the easy way to look at it. So you'll see on the card they'll show these little hourglasses. And then all you basically do is you would turn it, say it's going to take you two. You're going to turn it to the second. Then the next turn, you can put it up to the one. And then turn after that, boom, got it back. So I thought that was cool. And another aspect of the characters is that uh, just because a character is strength-based or magic-based or dexterity-based or, you know, faith-based, you, you can kind of customize the characters a bit. There's a lot of customization for the characters with the different skills, with the different spells, with the different equipment. And I, I dug that too. I liked that. Because a lot of times when you're playing these dungeon delve games, depending on your character class, to steal an RPG term, 
you're kind of locked into what you can do. So you know that your character, if they're kind of the tank sort of character, that, you know, they're there to absorb damage and to, you know, get up front and pound away. And you got your ranged characters, so on and so forth. Now I'm talking like MMOs, but... So I did like the fact that you're able to customize your characters. Then, of course, you've got treasures. So you got a deck of treasures, all different goodies that are available to be drawn. There are some... There are treasure chest tokens. There are door tokens. I just... Um, I've been dragging tail all day. Otherwise, I would have set a lot of this stuff up. But... Sorry. Anyway. Uh, so, there's, there's quite a lot going on in the game. And for the most part, like most dungeon delve games, you're going to move from one area to the next area. And you're going to explore. You're going to find treasure chests, you're going to encounter monsters, and the thing is, you'll know that there are monsters, because you get these tokens, and the scenario book is going to tell you how to lay out your little uh, play area, the dungeon, basically, and of course, this has nothing to do with the scenario book, I just put these together <laughs> just to fit them on the screen here. So, um, You'll have, uh, you'll have the pre-selected scenario and you'll have the, the map of how you put the tiles together. The tiles are all marked. Pop this one up, kind of give you an idea. They're marked, so if you'll see in the scenario book, it's gonna tell you, okay, you're gonna take, so for an example, this is tile 11A, whereas this is tile 11B. So they are dual-sided. Nice quality, nice thick, stock. I didn't have any issues with uh, any warping. Sometimes you'll see these uh, show up being warped. They uh, they did have to get punched, so that probably had a lot to do with them not warping in the box along the way. So what you really do is you're, you're, you'll have your, your team, your heroes, and they'll progress through the dungeon. And depending on what level they are, they're going to be able to, and what equipment and things like that they've got, they'll be able to move so far. They're going to have so many actions. They'll have one attack action or one like battle action. They'll have one normal action. So like a normal action is opening a door as an example. And as you go along, you will encounter the various, you'll see these shadow tokens that you're going to randomly put out where they're indicated in the scenario. And then as you reach these rooms, you're gonna discover what you're up against. And sometimes it'll just be uh, almost like an, N I guess we'd say NPC that just runs away. And the way I kind of looked at it was, it was a cowardly monster. It was like, whoa, forget it, I'm out of here. Uh, whereas other tokens will say, okay, well, you've run across a goblin or a goblin pack. And creatures can also spawn in, making uh, the fight that much tougher. So there's also kind of a, like a night and day phase to the game, where uh, after a certain period of time, it goes from night to day. I thought that was a little odd, honestly, because uh, you're in a dungeon. I don't really understand why night or day cycles would really matter, but it's just an extra wrinkle. Uh, really in the day, during the day cycle, there's no, uh, no penalties or anything like that. But let me grab a quick sip here. But show you a few more cards here. So, just uh, some examples of one of the characters has this wolf, which is actually uh, shown by another mini. I hadn't, I haven't pulled all the minis and stuff like that out. So anyway, yeah, long and short of it, you're going to be going through the dungeon. You're going to be discovering monsters, treasure chests, traps. You can find traps. And uh, when you're attacking, you're going to roll these dice. And as we look closely at the dice, you're going to have, like, some have multiple symbols on them. 
some have like lightning bolts and all these dice are going to equate to your character and your equipment just like defense same sort of thing you're looking to so you're looking to if you get hit you're going to be able to roll your defense to see if you can avoid those hits so when I mentioned yeah I thought it was a little odd that the goblin actually just boom automatically you get two hits you're still going to get to roll dice number depending on uh, some of the equipment and skills and things like that you've got uh, to avoid that damage and there are loads and loads of co counters and tokens and I mean just like a big handful of all this different stuff uh, that I not took out of the the baggies and that so there's uh, there's tons and tons of stuff in this game one thing that I have to say I'm not overly fond of well there are a few things I'm not overly fond of to be very honest uh, some of these cards I mean now granted I have no issue about busting out reading glasses when I'm I'm playing that's okay it's no big deal I, I pop them on here for some unboxings when I have a you know I figure you know I, I mean I can see pretty well sometimes when the print gets really small I gotta bust out reading glasses uh, a lot of these cards the print is awfully tiny there's a lot of stuff on these cards not all of them but some of them making them a little bit difficult to make out so this is a this is a good example here this is another good example where it's sort of like okay um, there's just a lot of stuff packed onto this small card they could have gone with bigger size cards and made life easier for everybody but they did not then again bigger cards means bigger box higher price tag I get that I understand that so I didn't necessarily care for that um, one thing that sort of I like the game but I don't love the game is how I'm gonna pretty much sum this up to me there's just a lot of busy work involved for what the game is now some people are gonna love that some people are gonna say man I love all the different little aspects and and I can see that I mean I enjoyed playing it if this was the only dungeon crawler that I had then yes I would probably be playing a lot of this it's not that's kind of the issue and I know there are loads and loads of dungeon crawlers out there uh, it, it I don't want to say it's too overly crowded you know genre of gaming but there are a lot of different options for your uh, purchase dollars I guess I would say there's a lot of choices you have out there so anyway so there's just tons and tons of stuff that just even we'll look at like the big baddie I mean there's all this stuff that you're looking at and all these different modifiers and everything you know like for an example um, the goblin he uh, one of his attacks disregards one point of armor because you can have you know armor points and things like that which always protect you from damage but then yeah okay so okay you got that and then you've got the different uh, ability you've got different abilities that may allow you to avoid a hit you've got all these spells that it can allow you to avoid a hit there's just you're sitting there when you're in combat you're sitting there looking at all these different factors rolling your dice with all these different symbols on it to just fight some goblins and that's why I say that there's just there's just way way too much busy work involved now if somebody is big fan of if they're role-playing game players and they play games that they're really focused on more of the tactical aspects of the game the combat story's not super important if they kind of kind of stick to a Monty Hall sort of approach to the role-playing games which you got to be old school to remember what Monty Hall means in role-playing games then this is going to be up their alley because they're going to be sitting there saying yeah okay all right cool I like all these little factors and stuff all adding but you have to go through all these computations every turn 
when you're when you're in a battle in that it's just um i don't know it just to me for an example the the game box indicates that you should be able to play one of excuse me one of the scenarios in 60 to 90 minutes there's no way there's absolutely no way maybe if you're playing with three players if you're playing with six players there's it's it's impossible you are not going to be able to get through one of the scenarios in 90 minutes you're probably looking at closer to three or four hours i'm not joking and i'm talking about that's even once you've wrapped your heads around the rules and know every little aspect of the game so whoever came up with, i don't know what they were smoking when they came up with 60 to 90 minutes and put it on the box because it it ain't happening duly it just taint does that make it a bad game no it doesn't uh, I enjoy big epic games. I don't mind hanging around and playing one game all afternoon if I'm having a blast. And don't get me wrong, swords, sword, I keep trying to make it a plural. Sword and sorcery is fun. We did enjoy it. Just when we compare it to other dungeon crawlers we played, I don't think it stacks up as well. So... I told you I was just going to do pretty much a really high overview of the game itself. Another aspect of the game, and I, I, you know, I'm sounding way probably more negative than I should, but this is a game, and dungeon crawlers are, are kind of like this. This is a game that takes a long time to set up. Not a ton of time. We're not talking Arkham Horror time, but we are talking about it does take uh, a good amount of time to get everything set up to start playing. This is also not a game that you can just jump right in and uh, get your get your feet wet and be like, okay, all right. Because even, you know, the first scenario is not all that difficult, but you still have to figure out all this stuff going on. Anyway, uh, as far as that was showing that stuff off so on its own merits i like it i like sword and sorcery immortal souls it's cool uh some of the players just were zoning out i mean there it, there isn't like a lot of downtime but there's just a lot of grind it takes quite a while to get through to the the big baddie at the end or the you know, the conclusion of the scenario because of all the, um, I'm not saying fiddliness, because I don't like that word, because it doesn't give you enough information. Just because of all the, the calculating that you gotta do, and it's easy to miss certain things, and it's like, oh wait, hang on, I had this piece of equipment, I totally forgot about that piece of equipment. And that's what I found was happening with some of the other players as we played Sword and Sorcery, is it was, they would just, um, kind of be overwhelmed by all the stuff they had sitting in front of them and a lot of the options they had available to them. So uh, on its own, I do like Sword and Sorcery Immortal Souls. I don't love it. I do like it. And I think for the right crowd, they will enjoy it. Now, you have to keep in mind, though, there are a lot of dungeon crawlers out there, and I will be the first to admit I have not played all of them by any stretch. So I cannot tell you how this stacks up against, say, Gloomhaven. And I, I will tell you one thing that I do know for a fact is that uh, Gloomhaven does not utilize dice. That doesn't necessarily mean there isn't randomness in Gloomhaven, but you're not rolling dice. And in this, yes, you're rolling dice a lot. You're rolling tons of dice. That's a, it's, if that's a problem with you, then okay. Yeah, you, you might steer towards Gloomhaven. Although I'm telling you right now, there's going to be randomness in Gloomhaven without me even having to take a look at it because there's cards. Cards add that randomness. So I can't, uh, I can't really compare it to, to Gloomhaven. I can tell you as far as like Descent, Journeys in the Dark... Uh, I liked Descent better. I did. Now, I'm not a huge, huge fan of Descent because I think that's another game that's got a, uh, a little too much busy work. Plus, I do dig the fact... Now, you don't need a, a 
a referee, game master, or anything like that for sword and sorcery. So that's cool. Okay, you're cooperating. Everybody's cooperating together. So that's nice. I like that. Um, whereas Descent, you've got the one player who's kind of like the old school dungeon master who's trying to wipe everybody out. Did like Descent a, a touch better. Uh, I can tell you as far as Folklore of the Affliction, which I have played quite a bit of, from, uh, and it's from Greenbrier Games, I like that way better. Uh, sure, yes, there's a lot, of, a lot of extra aspects to that game and things that you have to take into effect, like uh, equipment and skills and feats and things like that. But it just seems to be a lot easier to, to calculate all that stuff up. And plus, as I pointed out before, you know, these cards are small. There's a lot of, a lot of information packed on these cards. I think that um, Folklore of the Affliction lays all that stuff out much better than Ares Games. It's just, uh, and then like, uh, there's a storybook, I forgot. There's the Book of Secrets, which is kind of a, a little bit of a, kind of choose your own adventure to give more flavor to the uh, the game itself when you're playing. I thought it was okay. Uh, kind of strangely worded sometimes, but uh, I, I thought that was a bonus to the game. I did enjoy that. And of course, like folklore has got the same sort of thing. It's got kind of a storybook as create your own adventure aspect to it. Anyway, all in all, um, like I said, it's not a bad game. I just don't love the game. Maybe part of it was too, because I was playing with some players who just were having a hard time. And I it's I didn't play it just once. Because I mentioned before, I play games multiple times before I review them. Uh, unfortunately, I did have to play with the same people. Weren't I wasn't able to get other people, uh, which I usually like to do, at least get a few new players in. But uh, I think maybe part of it too was that the other players just had a really difficult time kind of keeping track of all the stuff that they had. I got to admit, sometimes I was like, oh, wait a second, I forgot that. Hang on. Anyway, so overall, uh, the positives I would say is um, I like I like the aspect where there's a little create your own adventure in there. Uh, I like the fact that the character classes don't all have to... Okay, so I'm I'm the big knight. I have to only be able to play this character one way. I like the, the ability to customize the, the characters uh, a little more than you could in most of these dungeon crawl games. So I dug that. Uh, I like... Uh, there's a lot of variety as far as um, the monster powers. So even though you're running into a goblin or uh, like a brigand, they're not always going to be the same exact kind of... They're not going to approach the, the battle the same way. I, I did like that. Uh, aspects I didn't care for. Uh, I didn't care for having to take a lot of time to set everything up. Not a huge, huge issue, especially if it's a game you're going to be playing for quite a few hours. Okay, that's all right. Just set up before everybody shows up uh miniatures cool sculpts solid plastic problem is a lot of a lot of misshapen um like the swords and stuff like that a lot of the thinner plastic not straight and sorry <laughs> boiling my miniatures is not really a solution in my book just my opinion people do it all the time I would prefer that the sculpts be a lot, uh, a lot sharper in production. Rule book, uh, eh, neither here nor there. It's not a standout rule book. It's not a horrible rule book either. You can understand it, but it, you're going to have to read through it a few times. Uh, so that's pretty much a neutral feeling on the rule book. Uh, and then the other thing I just didn't care for was um, all the kind of busy work, all the different calculations and things like that you got to go through uh just uh, you know through every battle I, I mentioned before it's not a lot of downtime but there's just a lot of rinse and repeat rinse and repeat and 
People start clocking out on that, you know, kind of zoning out during a game when it's just, okay, we're doing the same exact thing over and over again. So all in all, on a scale of 1 to 10, I guess people will probably be surprised at the score I give it. I'm going to give it 7. 7 out of 10. Not a bad game. It's a good game. I like the game. It's just not going to be the first one off my shelf when people say, hey, let's play a dungeon crawl. It's just not. I would certainly bust out Folklore of the Affliction uh, much quicker. Um, now, there are supposed to be other games in this series in the pipeline. I don't know. This game, I think, has flown under the radar for a lot of people. Uh, I know Gloomhaven has just been, wow, everybody is just doing what they can to get their hands on Gloomhaven. Oh, another aspect of, of uh, Sword and Sorcery was this was kickstarted. So the retail version of the game is a little different than the Kickstarter version of the game. And normally, yeah, outside of some extras and things like that, the two different editions aren't that radically different for most games. Here, it seems like um, you really needed to uh, take advantage of the Kickstarter because there were extra monsters and minis and things like that that uh, were included in the Kickstarter. But anyway, as I was saying, I believe Ares Games has um, some other uh, adventures, maybe expansions in the works. I don't know if they're going to do another full core game. Maybe they'll just do miniatures and stuff like that and new cards, new scenarios. Uh, but as I mentioned, I don't know for a fact that that'll happen because I don't really know how well this game is done. Wasn't any real buzz about it at Origins. Wasn't really any buzz about it at Gen Con. And uh, I don't hear a lot of people really talking about Sword and Sorcery. I hear everybody talking about Gloomhaven and uh, Folklore of the Affliction. It just did another Kickstarter for another print run of that. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I will tell you that if you are interested in picking up Sword and Sorcery, because like I said, it's not a bad game. Definitely go and look online to see if you can get a discount from some online retailer. Uh, you will like it better if you are not paying MSRP for Sword and Sorcery. So my apologies, uh, big Ares Games fans out there. If a um, little sad that this is only getting a 7 out of 10, but, you know, that's just how I, I got to look at it. I will mention that next week I am going to review... Uh, this War of Mine, which um, I don't want to give too much away, but okay, it's phenomenal. <laughs> That's all I got to tell you. It's phenomenal. Uh, and that was released through Ares Games. Um, I believe it was Gen Con it hit. I don't think it was out at Origins. I, I'm pretty sure that was Gen Con. All right. So anyway, so as I mentioned, tomorrow for War Game Wednesday, I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, fun with Fletcher Pratt's Naval Warfare, Naval War Game, I should say, with uh, my nephew and his friends. And uh, I'm also going to show you how to play Night of Man. I got other stuff cooking uh, later in the week. Uh... I just don't have them right here at hand to grab them and show them off. Duh. Sorry. Hopefully, I will be feeling better tomorrow. I better be. I'll still give it a try. Doesn't matter. So, I apologize. I'm a little out of it today. Just uh, under the weather, gang. It happens. It happens. It's flu season. I said I'm hoping it's not the flu. Anyway, when you are not watching The Daily Dope, Please go visit thegaminggang.com for the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. Come on, by now you know the drill. Get your game on. Uh, see, I can't even get my own tagline out. Oh, I am so discombobulated. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. And I will be back, hopefully, tomorrow. I am Jeff McAleer. At least I can pronounce my own name correctly. And uh, until next time, thank you so much for watching.